Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to On a Mic of Mike, the premier business radio program. I'm your host, Mike King. Appreciate you being here with me. You can follow me on all social platforms at On the Mic of Mike RVA, as well as Mike King Biz. This is the Popper Springs Hour right here. You got my man, Lamar, who's in the building with us, and we brought along Kent as well. Uh, gentlemen, welcome. Thank you. Man. Thank you. All righty, uh, Lamar, let's we, we We brought the heavy hitter in right here. We brought Ken in because it's a, a serious topic. Uh, but Lamar, let's start off with the elevator pitch. Who uh, Poplar Springs is? Absolutely. So uh, Poplar Springs, we are a behavioral health hospital located in uh, Petersburg, Virginia. Now we have a, a variety of services from adolescent services for acute or residential treatment. We also have a, a full military hospital, an outpatient clinic, and, and, and then also, you know, we do um, we do take walk-ins on our acute unit. So if you need to reach us, you can go to our website at poplarsprings.com, or you can call us toll-free at 866-546-2229. So you guys are taking everyone for instance, from 12 on up, uh, family right. members. We always talk about whether it is uh, infectious diseases, whatever it is right there, taking care of yourselves. You guys are, are always in the middle of it. But uh, the reason that we're here today talking, I got Brooke Kennedy. So Ken, go ahead and introduce yourself, sir. Yes, thank you. Um, my name is Ken Alfred. I am the Chief Nursing Officer, Chief Nurse Executive for Poplar Springs Hospital. In the past, sir, we've had a bunch of conversations about important topics, mental health being one of them, self-care. But we always, you always brought up the importance of mental health and suicide, being on the lookout for it in the last week with the... Uh, suicide of Twitch, the performer, it's come to the forefront. And if there's anybody that we would want to talk about it, it's you, sir. Uh, let's talk about where we are right now and, and some of the, your thoughts on it. Well, just so just some general stats so people can know the prevalence of suicide and depression. Um, suicide remains the 12th leading cause of death in, in, in the United States. Uh, it's the third leading cause of death for uh, people between the ages of 15 to 24, and there's one suicide every 11.5 minutes. Men tend to uh, be more successful, while women tend to attempt more. Uh, firearms, obviously, is the way that most men commit suicide, and poisoning is the way most females commit suicide. So as you can see, this is truly a health burden. Um, our job is to identify depression, which is the precursor to suicide, depression starts usually with a person feeling hopeless, not having any resources, feeling that they have no energy, they can't engage, they also lose interest in things that they have liked, their appetite change, their weight changes, and then there's also what we call suicidal thought. So they start to think about the suicide, and then some, some of these individuals actually do a plan and act upon it. So our job is to intervene before they go to the stage of trying to um, commit the act. One of my, my, we have Kent here with us, Chief Nursing Officer at Poplar Springs. We've had this conversation back in the spring and into the summer that the holidays are coming. It's added stress on people. Here we look up, it's the holidays and, and we're talking about that, but you're saying one, once every 11 minutes. Yes. That's, that's a that's a crazy number right there. Yes, approximately 800,000 um, individuals commit suicide a year. Um, that equates about 11.5 minutes. So when you month. get, uh, so a family member, when we're looking, you had talked about some of the uh, things that the red flags that people would look for. And I always ask you guys, whether it's you, uh, other members of your team, how are people doing out there? So, uh, Kent, what's the general, what, from a clinical standpoint, what's the mindset of how people are looking at the masses are doing? So this thing called depression is sometimes it's very insidious. Um, it could come about the person has a change of behavior, like they start to become sad, tearful. Um, they're not resolved by, you know, a person saying it's going to be okay. They um, continue for about two weeks of this behavior. Um, they also feel hopeless, like they have nothing to live for. Um, they are not um, consoled by their, their normal protective factors like a priest uh, or a friend. Um, they also can become, I uh, call it, uh, they, they lose interest in the things that they like. Um, they may not want to engage with people. They may want to isolate. 
And as they start to further down this road, Mike, they also become, um, they're changing. We noticed that they may change their eating habits. Their sleeping habits is significant as well. Um, they go from sleeping normally to maybe not sleeping at all. Um, this is called insomnia. And so those, uh, those changes, although insidious, may start to talk about a person maybe going down the pathway of depression. Um, and that that's so insidious. A lot of people don't get treated for depression, right? So unfortunately, someone may see these signs and not say they're, they're bad. And then as they continue to deteriorate, they can actually go um, into a, a suicidal uh, ideation or thought, which can lead to suicide attempt. One of my, my Poplar Springs Hospital, there are experts here. We're talking to them. So we come to the holidays. Explain to people why the holidays play such a big part in suicide attempts and depression. Oh, another thing, always see that's one of the great parts about having your own show is you can ask the experts. A lot of times people say, I'm depressed, I'm depressed. And but you're saying depression is a clinical. Yes. It's not just, you know, I'm I'm just down and I know that I'm depressed. Absolutely. So the term major depressive disorder, depression is a clinical term. So just because you wake up sad one day, Mike, that doesn't mean that you're, you're depressed. All of us have days where we're not our best. Uh, we may feel sad. We could have had a situational grief, uh, could have been someone close to us passed away or something happened. So that's not depression. That's sadness that we as humans experience. What depression is, according to um, a book that we call the DSM-5-TR, it is two weeks of more of hopelessness, uh, not having energy, not engaging, um, disengaged, changing weight, changing thought. That's significant. So two weeks, Mike, of those symptoms I just mentioned may allude to something called depression. Uh, sadness is situational. Depression is more chronic and pervasive. Um, and then the other thing is we talk about depression, um, there's ways that we can treat that, Mike. So even if a person is moving into that two week period or more, we have ways to treat that effectively where 80 or 90% of people who get treated for depression can um, actually go back into a normal state of mood. Let me ask you about age and gender. So if it's a, a younger person as parents, what maybe you've already given it's the appetite, it's those things, say a person less than 20 years old, what would be something that may stand out in that age group? Let's say it different than a person who's maybe 50 years old. So the mood changes in a young person is a little different from those in an older person. And what we look at as clinicians is anger, rage, and aggression. If suddenly a person is more angry or, or rage, and sometimes you see this at school, they miss those signs of why this person is so reactive and angry, where really that anger rage is a sign of underlying clinical depression. And that's more prominent in um, people of younger age. Boys, girls, any difference there? Same about same thing in terms of age is anger and aggression is manifested in men or boys as well as girls. How about older people? Somebody say in their 50s or maybe maybe 40s or, or whatever Twitch was it, 40s and 50s. You can see more isolative behaviors, like they disengage. They're no longer uh, maybe going to the community centers or meetings. They're no longer meeting with friends. Um, you see them, um, again, in that hopeless state. They feel like life is just a black cloud. Um, and then, of course, the tearfulness, the unable to get up, unable to move. Uh, depression, clinical depression is paralyzing. You can't really move uh, to get out the bed. You can't move to go to work. And so as those symptoms really start to increase, that's when you begin the emergence also of the suicidal thought. One of my, my uh, Kent is here with us, Lamar from Poplar Springs Hospital. So uh, Kent, if parents are out there, family members are out there, they start to see some of those uh, tendencies, things that you're talking about, the red flags. What are some of the things that, that they should do or steps that they should take? Well, first of all, uh, parents should be, you know, very keen to their children's mood and behaviors. Um, you know, teenage, teenage life is, is, is um, tough for anyone, right? Uh, teenagers are, tend to be moody. Um, some may be sad or uh, disengaged, but parents should really be, I guess, communicating to their children, trying to understand how they feel, engaging them, knowing their friends, because any situational thing, and going back to holidays, you had mentioned this before, holidays can bring what we call a situational depression, where perhaps the person had a bad experience or may not have the resources to do the things they want. 
and it could actually trigger um, these depressive symptoms that I just mentioned. So parents need to be very um, uh, aligned to their kids' mood, their behavior, asking questions, uh, talking to them about their day. And if they see any changes, Mike, they want to activate a behavioral health therapist, a mental health therapist to support them um, in a way of mental wellness. One of my Mike Kent is here with, with us, Lamar. As ladies and gentlemen, this is part of the Mike King Biz Radio Network, which is one of my Mike, the premier business radio program around. Kent, we had talked to you before about self-care from a business standpoint you you have a lot of clinicians you have staff there who hear a lot of bad things they hear a lot of heavy things and you have to help them take care of themselves as a business owner or for our business owners who are out there what are some of the things that they can look for policies they can put in place to help their staff as well well first of all just checking in um do you really know your employees? Are you really um, un understanding how they're doing? Like when you start your Monday meetings off, how was your weekend? Have you done self-care? I know with my team, uh, we actually do strategic things on the weekend to ensure that everybody's taking care of themselves. Um, that could be going to church, that could be singing, that could be doing activities of life that, that promote healing. Uh, it could be engaging in conversation. And I'm actively as a leader, I make sure that my, my staff also is getting time off. So I know they had a rough week or rough two or three or four weeks. I, I'll ask, I say, hey, have you used your PTO? Have you taken off some time for yourself? Are you doing these things to, to really make sure that you're okay so when you come back to work, that, that you know work is okay? So really you have to almost be very keen, very assertive, but engage with your staff in order to understand what they need and then push the, push the conversation, make sure that their mental health is okay and they're doing self-care activities. One of my, my ESPN Richmond, that's where you find us a choice, as well as International Business Radio. I got the uh, the dynamic duo from down in Petersburg. It is Kent. It is Lamar, who's here. So, uh, Kent, I have to jump on a bunch of different topics because I don't get to talk. You know, you are a big deal. I don't get to talk to you that much. <laughs> All right. So uh, last time we talked, it was a while back. You talked about compassion fatigue. Let's talk about let's let's give an update to our listeners exactly what that is. Because now we're coming through, uh, we've come through the pandemic somewhat, however, where we are now, uh, there are a lot of things happening. So explain to the listeners compassion fatigue and how people can uh, make sure they're taking care of themselves. Yes, Mike. That, so the old term used to be burnout. Yes. Um, I think yeah, everybody's familiar. Term back in the day, in my <laughs> age. Yes. <laughs> so we, we've gotten a little bit better at the science of it now. We call it compassion fatigue. And usually this is a term given to caregivers, not just nurses, but doctors, firefighters, um, anyone, uh, for your first responders, because they see so much trauma, Mike, every day in their workplace that sometimes the trauma can actually deactivate their ability to care. The trauma that they see um, starts to kind of erode at the compassion that they want to give. Um, and then that will manifest itself by apathy. So they don't, you know, care as much. Um, they start to call out. They start to have thoughts that this is not their calling. And then it also can decrease work productivity. And eventually some people actually walk away from their professions because they can no longer take the constant onslaught of trauma and, and the things associated with that. So what you're saying is they see in a lot of, that they have to do self-care. And a lot of times, uh, as I always said to you guys before, who takes care of the caregivers? Because, uh, you know, the caregiver won't stop. Somebody's going to, like you as a leader, has to say, hey, have you, is typically people say, how you doing? And that's to keep on moving because you really, Lord, you really don't want to know my story. <laughs> so the good news in that, Mike, is that, and I, I've actually used this with, with my our staff, uh, we have something called Employee Assistance Program. Most most companies have that. It's an outside company or agency that will literally take one or two or three sessions and kind of walk through what's causing the trauma and then offer some solutions to support uh, the employees. It's called Employee Assistance Program, EAP. And then if you have also insurance, um, getting a therapist. Again, nothing's wrong with having a therapist. All of us should have one uh, as a mental health checkup, a mental health check-in, and employers or supervisors should really be keen to ensure, keen on their employees to ensure that they're really taking care of their mental health. One of the great things is that you just talked about is EAP, 
A lot of times, most employees don't take advantage of that. They, they're they kind of leery of it. They're, they kind of look at it as like the folks over in HR. You know, it's kind of like, <laughs> you guys know what time it is. <laughs> right. So explain the reason why that's so important. Well, you know, if, if you can look at it from a couple ways. If you look at it generationally um, or culturally, uh, African-American men are notorious for not activating mental health services. I can speak to that because I'm an African-American male, right? Yes. Um, so, you, so you say, hey, go to EAP and we have a therapist on the line. They might look at you like, I'm all right, I'm all right. They'll diminish the what we see and then they'll also avoid taking advantage of the service. Um, for me as a leader, I'm more about supporting the person Um, I, I'm I'm your boss, but I want I'm have a resource here that can walk you through or help you to whatever is happening, and then we can have a conversation uh, moving forward. So you have to be really keen on your employees because everybody won't accept it. Uh, you have to really be encouraging, supportive. There's some people who I've I've just said, hey, consider my office. I'll call a number and I'll leave out because it's private. It's not supposed to be. I'm not supposed to be listening in. And you give them that number. You give them that resource. And then um, the ones who I've seen use it, I can honestly say, Mike, they have had a tremendous um, uh, turnaround with what was going on. And I may not have known the personal things regarding it, but it works. It's just getting the people to that resource and then telling them it will work, take advantage of it. There you go. On the mic, Mike, ESP in Richmond. Here. Mike, I did want to jump in yes. regarding the EAP. Um, we do have outpatient services. So if someone does decide that they need help, um, we can provide in-person or virtual services. So they don't actually need to come to the hospital. They can do it right at home. So if they want to do it uh, in person, you guys have the evening hours as well over at the Grove, correct? So that's that correct. person can, they can uh, engage you and not have it affect their work. Correct. Yep. Yeah. And that's this evening program is a God, uh, I call it a blessing because a lot of programs, you know, they're all nine to five. Everybody works nine to five, Mike, right? Look at us. Yes. Uh, but having that evening program, uh, you get off and you got a therapist there to support your day. Um, it's probably one of the most effective ways to reach people and to be uh, efficient for them in their workflow and their work life. All righty, Ken, as a medical professional, um, everyone was in love with nurses and and everyone during the pandemic, uh, sort of kind of like you guys are like teachers, you know, when, when the crisis is over, thanks a lot. Uh, so let's talk about recruiting of, of a, like an, edu, an opportunity, uh, a career as a nurse. You're talking to young folks who are out there. And so especially, you know, when you look at like an African-American man, opportunity for uh, in nursing for us. Well, I'm going to tell you, uh, we just started a collaboration with Brian Stratton. Shout um, out to Beth Murphy. Yes. <laughs> there you go. Uh, where we're actually um, encouraging our employees, Mike, to take advantage of the resources they have and to activate um, going back to school. I can tell you as an African-American male, nursing has been very good to me. Um, I've been able to support and help thousands of people teach, educate, um, even understand who I am as a person. Um, I can just say the passion I have to do this job is something that um, has been accentu accentuated by me doing the work and supporting people in crisis. And it's a noble cause, a noble profession. Um, and I encourage anyone um, on this listening right now, uh, particularly African-American men, take advantage of, of that. If that's something you want and working in healthcare, becoming a nurse is a great way to give back to the community because we so desperately need good people. One of the great parts is, so when one of your guys came on, he had, he had scrubs on. I told him, yo man, <laughs> I was a medic in the army, scrubs helped me get my wife. <laughs> they did. I was a medic in the hospital. Scrubs work. So it does offer you, you know, it is a real good opportunity to help people. All right, Lamar, let's talk about Poplar Springs always has some great things going on in the community. What you guys got going on out there? Absolutely. So, so first, I, I did want to say one quick thing uh, regarding the warning signs that Kent mentioned earlier. Um, if, you, if anyone online is listening to this and they are, are seeing this in their loved one, they can call us toll free. We can do an over the phone assessment, determine if they need to be brought to the hospital or not. Once they once they get here, we take walk-ins. So if we feel that they um, 
need further services outside of the hospital, we can recommend it to one of our community partners. Or if you feel that they need services here, we can get that taken care of as well. Because you guys have all the services that a person would need. Like you said, get on the phone, give us a call, and that way you'll be able to tell you're you're able to talk to professionals. You guys can determine uh, what's needed because the worst part about it is something happens and you didn't take advantage of of all the resources that were out there. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and then back to your, your question about what, what's going on in the community. I guess what's going on here in the community. We just wrapped up a Christmas parade. Um, uh, so as of right now, we, we are we are just preparing for the new year. Um, nothing else is really really planned out out in the community besides for um, we're feeding the homeless um, uh, with the Hope Center on the thirtieth. And other than that, let's get ready for two thousand twenty three. One of the things that you guys are big with the community, and that starts from the top down. Really, that says the culture about the place. Ken, in the, in the nursing corps, talk about culture. I always talk to leaders and, and business people about setting the right culture. Mm -hmm. So, you know, one of the things that, that we do, uh, we just launched this at our hospital. It's called Just Culture. It's it's a it's a, a algorithm that we use to support people um, in, in understanding if mistakes are made, that our process is being looked at, or is it the person? Um, we launched that last week, Mike, and that's just a way of us with nurses kind of being in the spotlight, you know, with some of the bad press about nurses actually getting, being indicted for medication errors. We wanted to be in front of our processes in place. Have we done the right training? Have we done the right education? And then we completely supported the employee as we move to patient safety. So very excited about that. Uh, we started that project next week, and that will be a culture shift for us. Instead of blaming the person, we look at processes and making sure that they are intact so that patients are safe. How do you come up with the, with the idea for something like that? Is it like one singular event or is it something that happens a couple of times like, okay, we gotta we gotta address something. Is it people or processes? Well, we we listen to our employees. Uh, they, they give us surveys, Mike, where they tell us how they feel. And then based upon that, we create these what we call action plans. So okay. it's employee driven uh, because maybe an organization may not need this. But if our employees are telling us this is something they need, this is something that we do as an organization uh, from the top down to ensure that our patients are uh, getting proper training and education. All right, on the mic of my here, we started the conversation all talking about suicide, suicide prevention, awareness, all that. So uh, Kent, give us some, some words of wisdom on the way out right here. Things that people should be looking for, self-care, whatever you got for us, man. First of all, take care of self-protective factors, making sure that people have a friend, um, someone that they can talk to, um, and then, of course, uh, making sure that they're doing things for themselves or they're doing exercises. One of the biggest way to um, stop depression and, and treatment of depression. So doing something physically each day, Mike, as a self-care activity. Uh, we studies are showing that uh, exercise is, is equivalent to taking an So doing exercise, um, taking care of self. If a person is going to a dark place, uh, making sure that there's resources. Lamar just mentioned the number that you can call here. Uh, if you feel like things aren't, you're not feeling right, that you feel differently, we will do that assessment for you. Um, if someone on the line is listening and they see something in a friend or a relative that's different, perhaps they're sad more, they're isolating, they're not um, eating, they're not sleeping, uh, their weight gain or weight loss, they should give us a call too. Because again, we have the resources to help uh, identify is this depression, is this situational sadness, or is this something else? So those are things I, I would say leaving off. All right, Lamar, how can people find you with that? Absolutely. And I, I would say in the toll free number to call is 866-546-2229. And in addition, if you are looking to join our team, you can go to poplarsprings.com. You can look at all of our career opportunities. Um, this is a phenomenal place to work. Kent does a lot with his team. He even does a, a YMCA retreat with them. <laughs> um, so yeah, yeah, feel free to check out our website and uh, give us a call. Ladies and gentlemen, that is Kent. That's Lamar, my partners down there. You guys are on the front lines. We'd like to thank you for all the stuff that you do. Happy holidays to you guys. And I'll tell everyone down there, yes. I said hello. Take care now. We'll do. <laughs> See you. All right. All right, man. Thank you.